series of bombings rock cities from New York to Miami. Embassies are attacked. Businesses are destroyed. Cuban Americans are gunned down by assassins. Deep within the U.S. Cuban exile community, a mysterious group emerges to take credit for the violence. A terrorist group known as Omega-7. In the 1970s, the FBI had a working knowledge of anti-Castro terrorists operating in the United States. But then a new group appeared, more violent and aggressive than their predecessors. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. All agents had to go on was a series of chilling phone calls, a mysterious voice, and the threat of more violence. FBI field officers from New York to Miami coordinated their efforts, determined to catch the vicious killers. New York City, the morning of June 6th, 1976, uptown Manhattan. A massive bomb detonates at the Cuban mission to the United Nations. New York police and the FBI rushed to investigate the explosion. I could actually hear the bombs go off from my apartment. Special Agent Larry Wack lives three blocks from the mission. He's on the scene in minutes. The devastation was unbelievable. My first reaction was, there's no way anybody walked away from this thing. And it turned out nobody got injured or hurt. Special Agent Wack examines the entrance of the mission. From the blast pattern, it looks like the bomb exploded directly in front of the door. He notices a security camera mounted overhead. Assuming that the guy walks up and sets it down at the door, he had to be on video. Agent Wack asks a Cuban diplomat for permission to look at the videotape. Told us that uh, we couldn't view it right away and that uh, they would take a look at it and uh, get back to me. Got a call the next day from one of the diplomatic personnel up there uh, who said that there's uh, nothing on the tape. And I said, oh, okay. This is the game we're going to play. It appears that the Cuban officials are keeping the videotaped evidence for their own intelligence, even if it cripples an FBI investigation. It would be nice in a perfect world if they said, look, here's a copy of the tape, and you do what you need to do with it, and, you know, we're going to keep the original, but um, it doesn't happen. A news station provides the FBI with a tape-recorded phone call from a man who claims he belongs to an anti-Castro organization that bombed the Cuban mission, Omega-7. We are Omega-7. Thank you. The FBI has never heard of Omega-7. For Cubans fleeing Fidel Castro's brutal regime, northern New Jersey has become a safe haven. It is home to nearly 100,000 Cuban immigrants. We're uh, trying to get uh, information. FBI agents talk with people in the community in an effort to identify members of Omega-7. Getting information from the Cuban uh, exile community was one of the most difficult things we ever ran across. Even if they knew who the guys were, to them, they're heroes. For the FBI, it's another dead end. Over the next two years, Omega-7 strikes targets in New York City again and again. They bomb the Cuban mission twice. 
Another bomb detonates at Lincoln Center, where an orchestra from Cuba had been performing. In each instance, a representative of Omega-7 calls local news stations to claim responsibility. The terrorist group is on a rampage, but the FBI has few leads. We were coming up with no witnesses. We were coming up with uh, pieces of uh, battery and whatever that wasn't going to pin down anybody. For now, investigators' only solid lead is a mysterious voice claiming responsibility for the violence. To FBI Special Agent Tom Menapace, all the tapes sound like the same person. There were slight variations in tone, but if you listen to them all at the same time, you really picked up kind of a common thread. The caller would identify himself always as a member of uh, Omega 7. Uh, most people pronounced it Omega. Uh, there was a distinct Omega with this guy. It was calm, collected. Here's what we did, here's why we did it. FBI agents in New York and Miami have interviewed dozens of suspected anti-Castro terrorists. But none of the agents recognize this particular voice. The voice was driving us crazy. Nobody's got this voice. We were taking copies of the tapes and playing them with prominent members of the community. And we were basically trying to get a name for that caller. But even those deeply involved in the Cuban community are unable to ID the caller. If there's not that immediate recognition, then a lot of times you get into an area where people are speculating. It's like, gee, it sounds like so-and-so, and, and you kind of know right there that, you know, they're, they're stretching. Yeah, they're locals. Thanks very much for your help. All right, yes, take sir. care. Thank you. Or Investigators also play the voice for informants they know have connections to various anti-Castro organizations. No one has any idea who the voice belongs to. I don't recognize anyone. And still, the bombings continue. Northern New Jersey, March 1979. Omega-7 bombs the offices of a Cuban businessman in northern New Jersey. His name is Eulalio Negren, an activist who helps reunite Cuban refugees with their families in the United States. At the scene, the FBI finds no witnesses and little evidence. Investigators believe the bomb is only a warning. If they meant to kill Negren with a bomb, I would think that they would have used a you know, more powerful device and known that he was there and put it on his car or something like that. That fall, more than three years after the original Omega-7 attack, another bomb explodes at the Cuban mission to the UN. The same mysterious voice calls news stations and takes credit on behalf of Omega-7. A month later, the terrorist group abruptly changes its pattern. Eulalio Negrin and his 12-year-old son leave their home. In New Jersey, two masked men attack a businessman for trying to free political prisoners in Cuba. The victim is Eulalio Negrin, a Cuban-American activist. Paramedics try to save his life, but he's lost a lot of blood. In the end, Negrin pays the ultimate price. Tragically, Negrin's 12-year-old son witnessed his father's horrible killing. FBI Special Agent Tom Menapace must interview the grief-stricken boy. He was in shock. Basically saw his father get killed. And um, that's pretty horrible. Special Agent Larry Wack is stunned by the brutality of the murder. 
there's a lot of unwritten rules out there in the game of uh, cops and robbers and bad guys. Shooting a man in front of his son is not part of the, the rules. And I found that to be uh, tremendously cold and calculating and began to realize that we were dealing with some pretty callous fellows. Union City Police recover empty brass cartridges believed to be from the shooter's weapon. The FBI and police question area residents. Could you tell how many people were inside? You do a real intense neighborhood investigation, essentially tracing the path in which the car was seen fleeing. Investigators finally find a witness who can describe the color, make, and model of the gunman's vehicle. At the Newark FBI office, Special Agent Menapace listens to a news tape in which a voice proudly claims credit for Negrin's murder. The stakes are getting higher. It's gone from being, you know, a bomb in a doorway, you know, endangering people to actually taking a life. A prominent man has been assassinated in front of his own home. But all Agent Menapace has to go on is a vague description of the killer's car. How many of them are registered in Union City or Hudson County or Elizabeth? Who are they registered to? Are any of those registrations people who we have as suspects in the case? In 1979, there was no computerized record system for vehicles by make and model. Okay. Investigators failed to find the killer's car. At the autopsy, a pathologist recovers several bullets from the murdered man's body. The bullets could be crucial evidence, but only if investigators can find the murder weapon. A month later, December 1979, the Cuban mission is bombed again. The Soviet mission is also attacked for providing aid to Cuba. The blast seriously injures an NYPD officer. Yet again, the mysterious voice of Omega-7 takes credit for both bombings. Miami, January 1980. A bomb partially destroys a small cigar factory. This is the third bombing in Miami in a year. To the FBI, the pattern is familiar. Special Agent George Kaczynski is a bomb tech with the FBI's Miami field office. There was a tremendous amount of damage done, not just to the building, but to the cigars that were being manufactured there, which are uh, manufactured by hand. As in New York, a representative of Omega-7 calls a local news station to take credit for the bombings. FBI Special Agent Tom Walzer believes the terrorists are trying to intimidate the shop owner who advocates better relations with Cuba. The goal was ultimately to get to the attention of the uh, Cuban community, but it was also to send a message to the individuals and businesses that had dialogue with the Castro regime, as well as to send a message to the island of Cuba itself. In Little Havana, a predominantly Cuban neighborhood in Miami, FBI agents and police continue to dig for clues. We have uh, good access to Cuban leaders, to individuals in the community, as well as uh, established sources that cooperate with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies because the Miami PD has informants, Metro Dade has them, FDLE has them, ATF has them. Despite their wealth of informants, the FBI comes up with nothing solid. Agents compare tape recordings of the Miami bombings with those from New York. They agree that it's the same person. As in New York, investigators play a tape for members of Miami's Cuban community. No one seems to recognize it. 
Manhattan, March 25th, 1980. FBI agents respond to a report that a bomb has been placed on a limousine belonging to the Cuban ambassador to the United Nations. Through interviews, investigators piece together what happened. When the chauffeur got the limo ready to take the ambassador to an appointment, he bumped the car in front of him. He got out to inspect the damage and found a shoebox wrapped in gray duct tape. The chauffeur was suspicious. He was aware that the mission had been bombed repeatedly. He put the box in a garbage can away from the mission and hurried inside to call police. When the NYPD bomb squad arrives, the chauffeur shows them where he put the suspicious device. But the garbage can is now empty. The officers realize the Department of Sanitation has made its regularly scheduled pickup. By now, the truck and the bomb could be anywhere in the city. In New York, a chauffeur finds a possible bomb underneath the limousine of the Cuban ambassador to the United Nations. He places the suspicious device in a trash can and calls the NYPD bomb squad. By the time they arrive, the device has been picked up by a city garbage truck. The bomb squad catches up to the truck. They question the driver, according to FBI Special Agent Tom Menapace. When they first ask him, you know, did you find something, a mechanical device in the trash? He says, no. They're like, it might be a bomb, at which point he's like, it's in the cab. The driver had spotted a radio receiver inside the box. He was planning to take it home. Inside the box is enough C4 explosive to potentially blow up a building. In the lab, an FBI bomb expert examines the device for fingerprints, hairs, and fibers. He finds nothing. Queens, New York, September 11th, 1980. Omega-7 claims another life. The victim is an attache of the Cuban mission to the United Nations. To my knowledge, it was the first assassination of a UN official in the history of the UN on US soil. A newly formed FBI NYPD task force investigates. It's the first joint terrorism task force in FBI history. In the fall of 1980, the FBI gets a break in the case. A former anti-Castro radical contacts Special Agent Larry Wack. He feels innocent people are dying and decides to cooperate. The informant cannot identify the members of Omega-7, but he has heard a rumor about the group. He had learned that there had been a significant split in the actual Omega uh, hierarchy, or as he called it, the board. Anything else? Agent Wack believes that once the FBI has identified suspects, they can exploit the division by pitting one faction against the other. Three months after the murder of the Cuban attache, a bomb explodes in front of the Cuban consulate in Montreal. At the New York FBI office, the task force wonders if Omega-7 members from the United States are responsible. According to the INS, shortly after the bomb exploded, a car entering the United States refused to stop for inspection. Border guards were unable to get the license plate number. The car was going too fast. But they did get a description of the vehicle. A short time later, a New York state trooper stopped a car matching that description. 
The two men inside the car denied running the border. Without a license plate number or other evidence of guilt, the officer was forced to let them go. But before he did, he wrote down the information from their driver's licenses, including their names, Enrique Erbons and Antonio Casaveres. The task force recognizes Erbon's name. He was known to us as a fanatical, violent exile from Miami. The other gentleman in the car was an unknown entity at that moment, which was interesting to us because the big question was, who is this guy? According to his driver's license, Casaverdes lives in New Jersey. Agent Menapace visits his apartment complex to talk to his neighbors. They tell him Casaveres recently moved to Miami. Menapace plays a tape of the suspect's voice. The neighbors all identify the mysterious man, the voice of Omega-7, as Antonio Casaveres. These people who knew him as a nice young guy, they were shocked that I'm sitting there playing these credit-taking calls for them, and they're recognizing the voice on the tapes as someone they know. It's a huge break in the case. The task force immediately gets a subpoena for Casaveri's phone records and begins to analyze who he has been calling. It's like uh, dropping a pebble in the water the leads go outward because you see who he calls, and then you see who they called. We start to see heavy calling uh, in, in times, in uh, dates leading up to incidents. And then on the day of the incident, no calls. And then after the fact, calls. From the phone records, the FBI identifies three other likely members of Omega-7. They analyze the credit card records of all four suspects. Among the charges are several automobile rentals. The car rentals were really one of the biggest things that really became of interest to us. Agents discover that some of the suspects had rented cars at Newark Airport just before the bombings and could have used them in the crimes. In fact, one man stands out because he had received a parking ticket across the street from the Cuban mission the same day that Omega-7 gunned down the Cuban attache. His name is Eduardo Mazoras. Miami, September 11th, 1981. A bomb explodes at the Mexican consulate. Omega-7 takes credit. Hours later, a second bomb explodes at the Mexican consulate in Manhattan. Once again, Omega-7 claims credit. Although the explosions are over 1,200 miles apart, Agent Menapace believes it's possible that a single person placed both bombs. One person had the time to fly from Florida to New Jersey or New York and carry out the bombings. Agent Menapace rushes to Newark Airport to check the records of rental car agencies. I just was basically working my way down the line, showing the pictures, asking them questions. At the very last rental car company, Menapace learns he's on the right track. The employee looks at the pictures and he says, you just missed this guy. Suspect Eduardo Mazoras had just traded in his rental car for a new one. He claimed that the brakes were bad. I said, well, where's that car that he just brought back? And the guy said, we haven't touched it yet. I said, don't touch it. I said, he has one of your cars now. And the man said, that's correct. Agent Menapace knows it's a huge break. I had the car at the curb that I believe he'd used in the bombings. I had a 
hard suspect in Omega-7, renting the car just before the bombings in New York and a couple hours after the bombings in Florida. Agent Menapace asks investigators to meet him at the rental agency. Time is of the essence. The FBI must stop Omega-7 before the terrorists strike again. Terrorist bombs explode at Mexican consulates in Miami and New York within hours of each other. The FBI believes Omega-7, an elusive group of Cuban radicals, used rental cars to drop off the bombs. Eduardo Mazoris, one of the FBI's prime suspects, has just returned a car at Newark Airport. Special Agent Tom Menapace calls in a canine unit to inspect the vehicle. The dog alerts on the trunk, the indication being that there was a bomb residue in the explosive residue in the trunk of that car. Investigators know that Mazoris has rented another car. When he returns it, agents are waiting for him. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Mazoris is surrounded by FBI agents disguised as customers and rental car employees. But with only circumstantial evidence, they decide to surveil him rather than arrest him. I immediately recognized him. He looked just like his picture. Agent Menapace follows the suspect on a shuttle bus to the terminal. I'm just another traveler waiting for a shuttle bus to, uh, to go to the terminal, and I'm going to stay with him as closely as I can. I'd like to buy a one-way ticket to Miami. Menapace watches as Mazoris gets in line to buy a ticket. And I'm maybe three or four feet behind him. I'm as close to him without burning the surveillance as I can. And what's your name? He uses a false name. He uses the name A. Medina. M-E-D-I-N-A. And he buys a ticket to Miami. As the suspect heads for his gate, Agent Menapace rushes to notify the FBI field office in Miami. In Miami, FBI agents follow the suspect from the airport through the narrow streets of Little Havana and eventually to his house. The Miami field office obtains a warrant to wiretap Mazoris's phone. Special Agent George Kaczynski. We monitor 24 hours a day and it's uh, very consuming. It takes up uh, a lot of man hours and a lot of personnel, and obviously they had to be bilingual. For a year, agents listen to the wiretap, but hear nothing that connects Mazoris with Omega-7. Everything we were doing was basically looking, looking for a thread, looking for that break, looking for that piece of information that was going to get us headed towards, to go from theory to reality to, to get to the actors. In the six years since the original Cuban mission bombing, the anti-Castro terrorist organization Omega-7 has spread fear through more than a dozen bombings and two assassinations. The FBI is determined to bring the group to justice. On September 2nd, 1982, at the federal courthouse in New York City, prosecutors subpoena all Omega-7 suspects to appear before a federal grand jury the FBI needs their statement on record before the statute of limitations runs out. But they have an ulterior motive. Knowing that Omega-7 is split into two rival factions, the FBI devises a scheme designed to pit one against the other. Agents arrange for the two factions to be in court on the same day. They watch as both groups meet in the hallway. It was evident to me in the courthouse when we were all there on the same floor that there was a lot of friction going on between him and them. There was a lot of animosity there. Agents want each faction to worry that the other faction may be cooperating against them. 
it could prompt some of them to make a deal. They certainly knew what they'd done, and they certainly knew who the members of the group were, and the fact that they're all there, and we're all there, is telling them, you know, without coming right out and saying it, the game's over. We're, we're closing the circle on you guys. Most of the suspects assert their Fifth Amendment rights and refuse to testify. Only Eduardo Mazoris takes the stand. He denies everything. But two weeks after the grand jury confrontation, Agent Wack returns to his office to find a message from Eduardo Mazoris. Agent Wack returns the call immediately. He basically said, uh, I want to come up to talk to you. Well, obviously, I'm not about to turn down that offer. So I said, well, when would you like this to be? And he said, well, I'm going to uh, arrive within the next couple of days, and I'll reach out for you then, and we'll arrange to meet. Fine, I'll be waiting for your call. Days later, Agent Wack and an NYPD detective meet Eduardo Mazoras at a hotel in Newark. Heard you got some information for he was very uh, well-groomed, and you think you were sitting there talking to, uh, a, you know, a New York City businessman about a deal coming up that was not really a big deal, at least in his eyes. Eduardo Mazoris tells them that he's come to negotiate with the FBI on behalf of Omega-7's leader, Omar. Omar's a little concerned that the FBI is getting close, uh, not just New York, but Miami, Newark, and everybody else that's participating in this thing. Mazzara says he's willing to tell them all about the crimes committed by the other faction, but only if the FBI promises to leave Omar's faction alone. Agent Wack asks to meet Omar in person. Mazzara tells him it's impossible, but he agrees to meet again the next day. Agents suspect that Omar does not exist. Agent Wack fears that he could be Omega-7's next target. The first thing we did was look under uh, the car we were driving, because at that juncture, I had no idea what this guy was up to. Possibly this was some sort of a setup. So we checked the car for a, a, a bomb pretty close when we left. The next day, investigators meet with Eduardo Mazoras for a second time. They confront the suspect about Omar's existence. You're Omar, and you are here to negotiate this whole thing. And he said, yes, you're, you're right. Omar. You're Omar. I have been someone in charge. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against Investigators you. read him his Miranda rights. You have the right to talk to an attorney have him present with you up. Mazoris talks about the criminal activities of his rival faction. He started identifying uh, the names of the people who put the bombs down. He initially uh, had, had problems remembering who did what, because they had done so much. The other group. Azores reveals that the rival faction has more than a quarter ton of explosives hidden away for future attacks. He tells investigators he's willing to return to Miami to help them find the explosives. He wanted to put the opposing faction permanently out of business and was hoping that in his own um, mysterious way that he could work a relationship with the FBI and the government that uh, uh, I'll help you get rid of them. I won't do this no more and leave me alone. But in damning his former comrades, Mazoris reveals that he is Omega-7's primary bomb maker. He is the one who was going to call the shots uh, as to who dies. Um, who gets bombed, how they carry it out. 
I remember thinking to myself that you're so deep. I don't even know if a deal's going to be possible with anything here. The FBI now faces a major dilemma. Mazuris is a confessed terrorist. They can either arrest him or they can take him back to Miami to find the explosives. The decision rises through the ranks of the FBI and the Department of Justice. It went all the way to the director of the FBI. Uh, whether we were going to make this trip to Miami. The director of the FBI declares that saving lives is paramount. They should send Eduardo Mazaris back to Miami. We were duty bound to attempt to uh, find those 600 to 800 pounds of uh, uh, high explosives. Um, those explosives could have killed a number of innocent people. We had to take a chance. We had to locate those explosives. Mazaris flies back to Miami. His FBI handlers travel on a separate flight, fearing their presence could jeopardize Mazaris's cover. Mazaris returns to Little Havana with instructions to check in by phone. For four days, the informant contacts the FBI to brief agents on his hunt for the explosives. Then, on the fifth day, Mazaris sounds odd. And he started wavering about uh, whether he could go on with this whole cooperative thing. I didn't like the tone I heard. I had a bad feeling about the call. Agent Wack encourages Mazuris to keep trying and to call him back that afternoon. What's going on? He begins to wonder if the explosives even exist or whether the informant is just manipulating the FBI. The FBI NYPD task force is in a difficult situation. They have released an informant, confessed terrorist Eduardo Mazoris, who claims he can lead them to a quarter ton of explosives. But now agents begin to doubt his intentions. The informant is acting strangely. Special Agent Larry Wack anxiously waits for the informant to call. Hello. He said, uh, yeah, right. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not coming back. He said, uh, I got to go. And there was a click on the other end of the phone. For the task force, it's a worst case scenario. Special Agent George Kaczynski of the Miami field office now has a terrorist loose in his city. We were devastated, and, uh, and then we had to regroup and say, okay, now we have to find them. Armed with federal warrants, the FBI finds and arrests Mazuris' colleagues. Up this wall, hands on your head, right hand down. They include Antonio Casaveres, suspected of bombing the Cuban mission in New York City. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used again. FBI agents search for Mazuris in Cuban communities in Miami and throughout the United States. FBI Special Agent Tom Walzer. He was out there as a fugitive on Miami. He had been identified, but he was still in charge of the group. Two weeks later, Special Agent Larry Wack receives an unexpected call. FBI. It's Mazuris. And I was shocked. I was absolutely caught off guard with this phone call. And basically, he starts apologizing for, for taking off. And I think he felt truly bad that he, he ran out on us. And, uh, and, and, and when he said he was sorry, I, I, I really believe he was. But he was also calling because he was trying to find out, what are you guys going to do with these other guys who did the murders and so on and so forth? And where is that going to leave me? Agent Wack devises a plan to trap the fugitive. Call me at home. He tells Mazuris to call him at home. I gave my home phone number with instructions that if he had to call again, uh, call collect. Call me later at my home. I didn't want to 
have him in a phone booth calling and all of a sudden run out of uh, quarters and have to hang up. Right. Investigators set up a trap and trace on all calls to Agent Wax home. At the very least, they will find out whether or not Mazoris is still in Miami. Days turn into weeks. There is no word from the fugitive. Then, a month and a half later, Agent Wack receives a call. It's him. I had to have my wife find a neighbor who was uh, awake at 2 in the morning, use their telephone to call the New York FBI office to make notifications down to Miami and to Miami uh, Telephone Company. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Agent Wack tries to keep Mazoris on the phone long enough to trace the call. Okay. Miami FBI agents speed to Little Havana. The call is coming from a payphone. You're talking about uh, having three, four minutes uh, max, so our chances of getting in there on time are very, very difficult. When agents arrive, the fugitive is gone. Hello? Over the next eight yeah. months, Eduardo yeah. Mazoris yeah. calls right. Agent Wack at home more than a dozen times. Right. No, go ahead. Agents continue their attempts to trap him. On one occasion, we missed him by a matter of minutes, where the phone was just dangling off the receiver, hanging down off the, the phone booth. Agents are frustrated, but remain persistent. They map the location of each payphone Mazoris uses. A pattern emerges. Every call has come from Little Havana. We felt very confident that he was living or working in that area. Investigators decide not to show the fugitive's photo around Little Havana. They fear he will flee to a different city or a different country. The last thing we wanted anybody to do was get word to him that we were zeroing in on an area. That's the last thing we wanted to happen because we didn't want him to leave. If he left, we were in big trouble. Agents do reach out to their most trusted informants in the area, but nobody has seen Eduardo Mazoris. They suspect the terrorist has gone into hiding. Then, on January 12, 1983, bombs explode at two Cuban businesses in Miami. A third bomb is found unexploded. Omar, a.k.a. Eduardo Mazoras, takes credit for the attacks. It was bad enough he's on the run. Now he's bombing again, and, and our first uh, reaction was, my God, if this guy kills anybody, we'll never live with ourselves. Larry Wack. The next night, Agent Wack receives a call. It's Mazoris. The first thing out of my mouth was, uh, did you do that thing last night? And he said, yeah. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to let you guys know I was still around and let the, the other side know I was still around and, and keep the enemy at bay, uh, the enemy being uh, you know, Castro. Wack tries to keep Mazoris on the phone as long as possible. He's worried by what he hears. I could tell he got a lot of enjoyment out of doing it. And that made me very nervous because he was going to get more enjoyment as the days went on if he didn't get caught. The FBI needs a better plan to trap Mazoris before more innocent people are killed. In Miami, an elusive bomber, Eduardo Mazoris, is on the run. After making a series of traced phone calls, the terrorist eludes the FBI's attempts to catch him. Agents must find a way to speed up their response time. In New York City, on July 20th, 1983, they get that chance. FBI Special Agent Larry Wack gets a call in the early morning hours. Larry Wack. It's Mazoris. 
Eddie. Agent Wack's wife notifies the FBI to set the trace in motion. FBI agents in Miami speed toward Little Havana, waiting for word on the caller's exact location. Well, I think uh, if you're still willing, there's probably way we Agent Wack tries to keep the fugitive on the phone as long as possible. I kept wondering, where is everybody? Where is everybody? Why haven't they gotten him yet? I'm almost running out of things to talk about. Right. All right. Mazaras hangs up. Bye. The FBI has lost him. Moments later, an agent arrives at the payphone. Mazaras is gone. The agent notices a man resembling Mazuras enter an apartment a block away. FBI Special Agent Tom Walzer. We were very excited but guarded. And uh, based on the location where he saw this individual go into, we had our hopes up. The FBI watches the apartment all night, but no one comes out. The next day, agents knock on the landlady's door. They show her a photo of the fugitive and ask if he lives there. She looked at the photo and said, yes, that's it. Right over at that house right there. I see. Rather than provoke a violent confrontation, the agents asked the landlady to call her tenant outside. She knocked on the door and asked uh, for him to come to the door in Spanish. FBI, outside, outside. He was in complete shock when he saw us, uh, a group of agents armed. He was very surprised, and he was uh, placed under arrest. I'm gonna catch you guys. Inside the apartment, agents find the tools of the terrorists' deadly trade. He had numerous weapons, silencers, uh, Omega-7 stickers, uh, vests, uh, other paramilitary uh, paraphernalia, um, uh, bomb components. Agents also find remote control devices and half-built timers for setting off bombs. I think that he was preparing to conduct terrorist activities because those timers were at different stages. We felt very gratified that we were able to stop it before anybody got hurt. The federal jury convicts Eduardo Mazaras of bombings, conspiracy, and the murder of the Cuban mission attache. He is sentenced to life in prison. Other members of Omega-7, already incarcerated, plead guilty to conspiracy to murder a foreign official and conspiracy to bomb property of a foreign government. They are sentenced to 10 years in prison. And I think it sent a message to the exile community that, look, we understand you're anti-Castro and you hate communism as much as most of us, but I got bad news for you, pal. You're not gonna bring your methods to our streets. The successful conclusion of the Omega-7 case in the summer of 1983 does send a message. It brings an end to anti-Castro terrorism within the United States.